Hello and welcome everyone to another Sales Hacker webinar. My name is Scott Barker and I'm going to just be doing my very best to really get out of the way on this webinar um, because I am joined by my dear friend, Josh Braun. Josh, welcome to the Sales Hacker community. Thank you, Scott, for having me. The title of this, how to diffuse objections. Here's one that we always get. I'm not interested. If you're like most salespeople, when you see this objection or you hear it, you respond like this. Hey, I understand client XYZ told me the same thing, but what she found was our solution improved their closing rates. Or maybe you get this objection. We have a vendor. And if you're like most salespeople, you might respond by saying something like this. Many of our current customers have used different vendors too, but what they found is that they had more value proposition with X. The problem is when you play tug of war with people, it rarely gets you anywhere. Changing minds just doesn't work. It's a net negative every single time. Even if you do win, you end up making the other person feel bad. When people feel like you're trying to change their mind, they actually dig their heels in deeper. It's called the backfire effect. If I tell Scott, hey, buddy, we can go anywhere but sushi. Scott, where are you going to want to go? I want that, that sushi just so bad. He wants that sushi so bad. So what I want to do on this webinar is teach you a way out, a way to have more productive conversations so that you can get to more truth. Not only in a business lens, but also through a personal lens. And the way we're going to get the way out is by actually introducing you to a friend of mine. His name is Chris Voss. There he is on the left. And there I am on the right, a, right, a Voss fan. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you some things that I learned from Chris Voss, who is a former hostage negotiator and author of a New York Times selling best book called Never Split the Difference, and how I'm applying his techniques to objections and how I'm diffusing them. And I'm gonna just take you through some examples, which will really burn it in. This is not a substitution for reading Chris's material. In fact, at the end, I'm gonna have a special offer for some of Chris's materials, so stick around. First, I wanna go through some foundational work very briefly, and then we're gonna get through some specific examples. So here's the foundation. Whenever you hear someone pushing back about anything, whether it's political, whether it's an objection in sales, whether it's something you don't believe in, I want you to resist the urge to push back. Resist the urge to overcome the objection. Resist the urge to tell someone why you're right. I don't know about you, Scott, but every single time I've tried to change someone's mind, not once have they ever said, you know what, Josh, I never thought about it that way. I'm going to switch who I'm voting for. It just doesn't <laughs> happen. Sure doesn't. This is what changing mind sounds like. Again, hey, Josh, sounds great, but we don't want a 12 month contract. Let me try to change your mind. Well, look, our solution requires time and resources to implement and to learn how to use. It wouldn't be worth your time if you're only gonna use it for a few months. And not once after someone says this, does the other person say, you know what, you're right, we'll take a 12 month contract. It just doesn't work that way because changing minds doesn't work. Your goal is to not overcome an objection. It's the opposite of what you've probably been taught. The goal is to understand them. When someone disagrees with you, your goal is to understand them even if you don't agree. It's possible to make people feel heard regardless of what you think. Everyone has the hunger to be heard. And knowing how to make, make people feel heard is a superpower that can help you get through to anyone in your personal or in your professional life. When people feel understood, they're going to tell you the truth. And the truth is only going to be one of two things. One, I want to end the conversation for now. Or two, I'm open to chatting further. When you create an environment where people feel comfortable telling you the truth, you spend less time chasing. The problem is we're not really great at listening. We actually listen 
to talk. So this is a new muscle. You're going to learn some of the information, but the practicing is key. Let's get into it. Let's go through some objections and how to defuse them. A couple of examples. Pretend I'm an accountant in a sea of accountants and I'm selling to small business owners. Just like you, every single small business owner has a solution in place. In this case, an accountant. First, we have to figure out what is it that a small business owner doesn't want that we think we can help them with. Well, what small business owners never want is to overpay taxes and insurance premiums. They never want that. And so if you have a better mousetrap and a different way for them to help do that, they might be interested. But as you can imagine, when you pitch, one of the first things they're going to say is, I already have an accountant. Or in your language, it might be, we're already using a vendor for that. In no situation are you ever going to call anyone where they're not going to be doing nothing. So this is a very common objection. When you hear an objection, step number one is to do the hardest thing, which is to just pause. And I'm going to demonstrate what that sounds like. So Scott's going to say, I have an accountant already. I have an accountant already. Okay, that, what you just heard, is what's called pausing. And what it's going to do is it's just going to give you a second to collect your thoughts and to be aware that you're about to try to overcome something. And that pausing is just going to give you the space that you need to not react and slow it down. And then in a calm voice, what you're going to try to do is get some more information from the person. This is a technique called mirroring. Chris Voss talks about. And mirroring is a really simple technique where you repeat the last two or three important words that someone said with a slight uptone. So Scott says, I have an accountant. I would say, I'm sorry, an accountant? And what you'll see when you do this in your personal or business life, and I thought this was a little hokey when I first learned it, is people will just keep talking. They'll give you some more information. And again, it gets back to people feeling like you're actually trying to understand them rather than overcome them. And when people feel understood, they're more likely to what you have to say. Step two, as Scott starts to talk a little bit more, I'm going to label. Um, labeling describes the underlying emotion that someone's feeling. Uh, Chris Voss did this beautifully to me when I interviewed him on my podcast. I was telling him about my passion for triathlon and why I was doing them because my dad died and why I wanted to do them when I was 50. And then he paused and he said this. Sounds like you were really close with your dad. And man, did that really hit me, even though I knew what he was doing. And that's the power of labeling. Again, it gets back to making people feel heard. So in this case, I might say, sounds like you're really happy with him. And what this question does is it gets the other person to think, well, am I really happy with him? And what you'll often get when you ask a question like this is they start to maybe tell you reasons why they're happy, but also why they're not. And then we go to step three, or sorry, step four, which is what's called an accusation audit. This is where we're going to see if they're open to possibly a better or different way to do something. Um, accusation audits label the negative emotion someone might already be feeling. They label the negatives. When you label the negative thing someone's already thinking, it diffuses it. By way of example, if someone always tells me I'm going to be expensive, what I'll say at the beginning is, someone asks for a price, I'll say, you're probably going to think I'm really expensive, way out of your budget. Because that's the negative emotion they're feeling. So in this instance, I might say, you're probably going to think I didn't do my homework on your business. But would you be opposed to seeing if there are opportunities beyond what you have now to avoid overpaying taxes and insurance premiums? Now let's dissect this a little bit. First part there is the accusation audit. I'm labeling the negative emotion they're feeling. Would you be opposed is what Chris Voss calls a no orientated question. Prospects are so used to sales reps trying to persuade them to say yes, that they're apprehensive and they feel like they're being led into a yes trap. No feels more safe. And then the last part, are you open to seeing some opportunities beyond what you have now 
to avoid that thing that you don't want. Aversion loss, fear of loss, fear of spending more is more of a stronger motivator than fear of gain. Now I've listened to calls all the time when people are using these approaches. And it's amazing when you use this, people just open up and they say, no, I wouldn't be opposed to learning more. So that's an example. Let's go for another one. I'm a sales trainer. I sell to VPs of sales. What don't they want? They don't want to miss quota. This is one that I had uh, three weeks ago, a deal that I closed. The client said, the VP of sales said, hey, we're considering a few vendors for sales training. So what did I say, Scott? Nothing. Good job. <laughs> Number two, it. I mirrored. And what would that sound like, Scott? A few vendors? That's exactly right. A few vendors. And they went on and they spoke a little bit about the people that they were looking at. Step three, this is another technique Chris Voss teaches. It's a masterful technique. Takes a long time to master, easy to understand. Calibrated questions get the other person to solve the problem rather than you solving it. In this case, they give the other person the opportunity to give you your value proposition rather than you giving you the value proposition. So typically when someone asks this question, the salesperson's inclination is to rattle off all the reasons why they're better. But those are your reasons. They may not matter to the prospect. So this is exactly what I said. Hey, you've got John Burroughs. You got Jacko over at Winning by Design, Richard Harris. What's making you consider a former elementary school teacher? And then this VP of sales gave me all of his reasons why he thought I was different, which are much more powerful than my reasons. And I ended up closing this business. Let's go through another example. Your price is too high. So my price was for another project, $11,875. Price is too high. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause. Hey, Josh, your price is too high. That, that's what pausing sounds like. It's about two seconds. Step two. I'm sorry, too high? Just like that in uh, what Chris Voss calls a late night FM DJ voice. Uh, the tonality matters just as much, if not more, than what it is that you're saying. So this late night DJ FM voice is a slow, calm voice with a slight downtone. That's the opposite of a hypey voice. Now there's different voices that you use based on different scenarios. So someone says your price is too high, I'm gonna say, I'm sorry, too high? And what you're gonna hear in the power of mirroring is that the other person's gonna keep talking. They're gonna give you a lot more information. This is a technique that you can actually practice in your personal life with your friends. Someone says something, you just mirror, label, mirror, label, mirror, label. And you'll be surprised about the amount of information that you'll keep listening to. Step three, I'm gonna label. So they're saying, hey, it's really too high. You guys are like way more than we wanna pay. Now notice this person's not giving me a, another number. So what I'm gonna to try to do is get that other number from the person. I'm gonna use a calibrated question to do that. It actually creates the illusion of control. So here's the question. This is probably gonna come across as intrusive. Because that's what they might be thinking. Now we're talking about money here. But it sounds like you have a limit to what you wanna invest in sales training. The hardest thing to do after you label is what I just did, is to not say anything. It's really difficult for me it takes a tremendous amount of practice to be able to nail it, but to just resist the urge to talking past the period. Again, this is probably gonna come across as intrusive, but it sounds like you've got a limit to what you wanna invest in sales training. The prospect came back and said, yeah, it's, it's $8,500. Remember I was a little over 11,000. 
So I'm going to pause again. And I'm going to use another technique. This is called an assertive tone. An assertive tone is when there's no room for budging. It's extremely powerful in these scenarios. And this is what it sounds like. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I just can't do that price. And then again, really quiet. So this is exactly what I did. And the prospect came back a couple minutes later in the conversation and said, $9,500, that's our max. That's the objection. So I paused. And then I took out the calibrated question. Now, calibrated questions are extremely powerful. I want to review these again because it's such a, a powerful concept. Your inclination is to solve the problem. Calibrated questions enlist the help of the other person. When people feel like they're helping, they're more bought in. You're the one asking the question, but the other person is solving the problem. So here's the question. That's a very generous offer. I really appreciate you considering me. But how am I supposed to reduce the price with, without reducing the number of reps that I'm training? I just think about that question for a second. How am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to reduce my price when you don't want me to train less reps? An another example of that is what Voss did in a hostage negotiation when a terrorist was threatening to kill the hostage unless he gave them $50,000. And he said something to the effect of, how do I know she's still alive? And he was able to put her on the phone and that opened up the conversation. So these kind of questions are extremely powerful. I use them a lot in negotiations and I also use them a lot in objection handling um, as well. That ended up closing for $11,800. Let me give you another example. You might hear this objection. It's another really common one. Um, I don't want an annual contract. I don't want to sign 12 months. We saw at the beginning of the presentation what the typical answer to that is, and rarely does that get you anywhere because people don't feel heard. So step one, hard part, pause. Step two, mirror. That's your, that's your cue, Scott. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute there, man. <laughs> See, Scott Annual was contract? practicing. His, I love how Scott practices his the silence. Boss. It's the best. <laughs> Josh, can I interject with one question? Because I think yeah, it's a yeah, fantastic yeah. question. And I think it will help hit this home. Mike Robison has a great question. Mike, thank you for the question. What do you do if the person responds to your mirror with just a simple yes or no? So this then is what... what this is, this, this, is what, this is a great question. Sounds like there's more here than meets the eye. Right, the labeling and the mirroring always works, but sometimes you gotta ask a second label or a second mirror. Mm -hmm. Sounds like I might be missing something. Sounds like I don't know all the moving pieces. Now, obviously, if you ask a question, you know, if someone says, um, you know, I, something that's blatantly obvious, you might want to just go to a label. These things yeah. don't have to be done in order. They're more like Lego pieces. Um, but oftentimes, if I'm not getting a lot of information when I do the label, I'll respond with another label. Looks like I'm missing something. Looks like you're not feeling good about this. Looks like I might not have the whole story. Hmm. And then again, if you're quiet and you give the label a chance to work, um, oftentimes you'll get people talking again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. So if just to synthesize that, so if, if you're not getting anything from a, a mirror, move to the label. And if they're still not giving you anything, you can try another label. And yeah, certainly when you when you start labeling people, you kind of have you, you want to because they're either right or wrong about something and you can't really help but respond. 
Yeah, uh, the, labeling, the labeling is tricky because when I first started learning it, Scott, I'd be interested to hear your take on this as well. My inclination when I first started learning it was, I'm just going to repeat back what the other person said. It's not that. I mean, the example that I gave earlier with my dad in the triathlon, the power of it was reading between the lines. It's mm -hmm. like the underlying emotion that someone's probably thinking. You know, like on a cold call, um, hey, Scott, you, you're probably going to want to hang up on me because this is a cold call. <laughs> it's, it's that it's that idea yeah i love it man mike thanks for the great uh great question i don't know if there's anything else jumping out at you scott in terms of questions i think i think we're we're good i think we're just blowing people's minds over here man let's keep it going okay i want to before i do this next one i want to do a quick poll that i want to just get a sense of when people are raising objections do you feel kind of tongue-tied a little bit? Like you're not exactly sure what to say. You're maybe a little bit off balance. So we're having these, these polls coming in now a little bit. What's your prediction here, Josh? I'm not sure if you can see is gonna that. prediction is going to be like 80% tongue-tied, 20% not tongue-tied. And that's only because I'm looking at the stats. <laughs> Directly <laughs> looking at them. I think it's like 81 to 19, something around there. Yeah. I want to ask the question, right. Scott, why do you think that is? Why do you think so many people are, are tongue tied? I think it comes back to what you, you said at the beginning, it, it, they feel like they need to change the person's mind, right? So you're, you're, you're reeling and you're like, Oh, how do I, how do I quickly change this? They're not using the, the pauses. They're not even giving themselves time to think. So your tongue gets all tied because you don't have time to process the information. And you're trying to refute what they're saying or change their mind, which is a difficult task. It's yeah, what I would intent, assume. That, that, that's exactly right. That's we should talk a little bit about intent. When your intent is to overcome so you can proceed forward, that's where the pressure comes. Mm -hmm. When your intent is to understand and then to see if the prospect is open to continuing the conversation or not, and being comfortable either way, because you can't create problems, you can only align with them. You can't create the problem or the motivation. You can shine the light, which is essentially what we're doing here, and see if the prospect is motivated. And if they're not, that's okay. Because when mm -hmm. we cling on too tightly, as 38 Special said, we lose control. Scott's going to not know that reference because he's far younger than me, but he will <laughs> Google it afterwards. But that's what ends up happening when we're trying to push and when we're trying to hang on. And John Burroughs said something to me a while back, which I thought was really brilliant, that clinging on too tightly is due to one thing, which is your pipeline's not fat. <laughs> I remember talking to him about this at a conference and he's like, yeah, do you just need more pipeline? And so when you have more conversations with people, when you learn these skills, that'll go away. When you have an abundance mindset where you're indifferent to the outcome, that tongue tied is because you don't have the tools which we're going through now you haven't practiced, which is a big part of it, and you have an intent to overcome and to win and to proceed the sale. It's those three things. The knowledge which you're getting now, the knowledge is not going to change your outcome. A lot of you are going to get this and say, hey, I went through the webinar and I, I got the knowledge. But then I'm going to ask, are you doing it? And the answer is going to be no. Because in order to get really proficient at this, and we're going to give you some tools at the end of this webinar. This has to be practiced. You got to get your reps in. I practice this every day. Every chance I get, I practice mirroring and labeling. And any kind of conflict I, get, I have an opportunity in my business or my personal life, I practice this. And the more you practice it outside the context of objections, the more comfortable it's going to feel. The labeling is interesting, Scott. And Scott, you're really good at this because you have a good sense of what people are feeling. Like in your gut, you kind of can sense it. All you have to do is just say it. Mm -hmm. Trust your gut. Gee, I think what this person is really saying is he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to yeah. think, so I might say, you probably think I'm being too pushy. And remember, labeling the negative diffuses the negative. I'll give you just one more example because it's so powerful. Um, I was in a pretty heated discussion with a colleague in my last job, we just ha always had conflicts and I didn't have these tools back then. And so it wasn't a good working relationship. 
Uh, Chris Voss taught me a very powerful phrase, anytime something getting, is getting heated, that I use sometimes. And here's the phrase. Like Scott, let's pretend Scott was coming at me with a lot of confrontational energy. He was mad at me for something. And I said this to Scott. Scott, I'm sorry for being such an asshole. Unless you're a so sociopath, it's going to be really hard for someone to kind of come at you more. Uh, so this idea of being a little humble and being a little vulnerable is really the opposite of what we're trained in sometimes as salespeople, um, but it really creates more productive conversations. Mm -hmm. I okay. love it. Yeah. The questions are, are flying in, but let's, let's, let's keep going with this one. Do you, this one is good though, but I'm not sure if we'll get to it. Uh, you might already have it in your deck, Josh. This is how do you overcome? I'm not interested. One of the most common objections ever. How, yeah. how do you deal with that? So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to cover that. So when cool. you're, when someone's not interested, typically it means that you're not interesting. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about this objection, but there's ways to kind of prevent that from happening in the beginning. But if you get it, I might say something to the effect of in a kind of Voss style, sounds like my pitch missed the mark. Sounds like I'm completely irrelevant. Sounds like I really messed up this pitch. And then be quiet. Now again, that's a Band-Aid. Typically, if you're hearing that too much, there's something going on with what you're saying, your message or who you're calling. Outside the, con the uh, the scope of this particular webinar. But if you're hearing that a lot, you got bigger problems. That's a Band-Aid. Uh -huh. um, again, if, you're, if people are saying you're not interesting, you're not interested, you're probably not interesting to them. Yeah, I would, I would add on, on top of that as well, and Josh, I know you talk a lot about this, is your tonality too. It can be as simple as you sound like a BDR or you sound like a salesperson trying to. So I've I didn't even hear what you said. My just heuristic pattern in my brain identified you as a salesperson and I just blank and say, I'm not interested. Yeah, the, the number one culprit of that objection is that you don't understand that a crispy or specific level, the prospect's problem, and if it's intense and frequent enough to warrant switching and changing. Let me give you just a quick example. I don't wanna to get too far off, but I, people have problems all the time. I have a pixel out on my TV in the back bedroom, but I barely watch that TV and I barely notice the pixel. So I'm not getting a new TV even if you called me because I have limited resources. If I had all the money in the world, I'd replace my TV, but I don't. Neither do you, neither does your prospect. So understanding specifically, what's the black and white version of the infomercial for my prospect? Are they cutting French fries with a knife? It's taken them three hours. What can they now do better because of X that they couldn't do before specifically? And it doesn't sound like optimize, increasing, saving time, or any of those other jargon words. And because you've never done the job of your prospect, it's hard for you to visualize it. And that's the number one cause. You have to understand the problem at a very crispy level. Again, we're so sidetracked, but I just wanted mm -hmm. to address it. All right. That was helpful. Let's get to this one. Um, I don't want an annual contract. So let's look at the mirror. Mirror is simple, right? Annual contract? Or sorry, an, an annual contract? And maybe they say, yeah, that's right. I don't, I don't want an annual contract. We've rolled stuff like this out before and nobody ever ends up using it. It's a big, like a big waste of money. To which I might say, what about an annual contract doesn't work for you? And they might say what I just said. That's a calibrated question. I'm going to get them to expand. Well, we've rolled this out before and we just don't get the utilization. So I want to go month to month to ensure it's actually being utilized. So I'm not paying for something that's not being used. Again, the calibrated question enlists their help to give you more information. And then I'm going to label. Sounds like you don't want to be locked in for 12 months if there is an adoption. Sounds like you don't want to be locked in if only half of your reps are using this. So if I'm outreach, maybe this is an objection outreach gets. Sounds like you don't want to be locked in if only 
10% of your reps are using this. And what you're listening for, Voss calls, are these two magic words, which is, that's right. That's right. That's when you know you've done this really well. Um, it takes a lot of practice. And then I might say, an accusation on it. You're probably going to think this is impossible. You're probably going to think this won't work. You're probably going to think this is a terrible idea. But would you be opposed to us taking responsibility of ensuring that there's adoption? So again, understanding the root cause of why the person doesn't want the annual contract using a calibrated question and then phrasing the negative feelings that they're probably thinking, which is there's no way we can get adoption if we did it ourselves, or possibly if you took it out of responsibility, we'd be more open to it. Timing is off due to COVID or timing is off in general. This happens a lot, right? And I was just talking to an SDR and AE before this call, I actually have this recorded and he used this exact script and he told me his words, I don't know if it's true or not, you know, 75, 80% of the time when he hears this timing is off objection, he's able to schedule a follow-up conversation using this exact methodology. Okay, so here it is. Timing is off. Sounds, it sounds interesting, but hey, got a lot of priorities and the timing's off because of COVID and all kinds of other things. Again, not all problems are intense and frequent enough to warrant solving right now when you call. It could be just a pixel out in the back bedroom. Could be interesting, but maybe not right now. So pausing. This rep did a masterful job of pausing. Step two, mirror. Due to COVID? And you listen to the prospect opening up. Yeah, we're working on this and this and this and COVID's been this. And the, the SDR was, did some more mirroring and some labeling and this, this went on for a little bit. And that's the key to it, right? When people feel understood and they're talking, they're more open to what it is you have to suggest at the end. It's when you get to the end and try to overcome that they're closed off. So the mirror due to COVID, accusation on it. Here's exactly what the SDR said. You know, would it be a terrible idea? Remember that no oriented question to see if there are opportunities beyond what you have now for X, the thing you want to achieve. Not for now. Just so you can have it in your back pocket for when this shit show ends. Now, let's dissect that. I'm gonna actually go to somebody in the audience here and I wanna ask the question, what does this phrase not for now do to the prospect? Why is that so disarming? Does anyone have any ideas? Let's hear it in the chat. There we go. It's coming in. Every, everyone seems to say it's taking the pressure off of them. Pressure relief. Yeah. Remember, the pressure is created when people feel like you're trying to get them to do something now. And what we're trying to do here is start a conversation. Very rarely when you book a meeting with someone on an outbound call, are they ready to buy right now? What we're trying to do is just start a conversation, plant some seeds that we can nurture along for when the timing is right. Again, would it be a terrible idea? No orientated question. And then that middle part, which is really key. We're not gonna bash what they're doing. Nobody likes to feel like their current solution is wrong. I was reviewing some emails for a client that I'm working with right now. And they were using the term, are you wasting time doing X? Nobody wants to feel like their current process is wasting time. Words are really important. So let's be more positive. You know, are there opportunities beyond what you have now for getting higher response rates on your emails or for saving premiums or for X, Y, or Z? Not for now, just so you can be more knowledgeable for when this shit show ends. Now, why am I using this word shit show? Why am I actually cursing, do you think? That's a, that's a hard question, but let's see if anyone, anyone can pick up on that. Yeah, it looks like they're, they're getting into my, my eyes. Makes you human, I think. You know, that's real language that real people use. So you're no longer just salesperson Josh, you're 
You're a human just like me. Scott, is it just me or do we have very intelligent people on this webinar more so than normal? We do. We, we do. We certainly do. There's also a lot of people. Do you have a name of someone that said that? Can we call someone out? Did someone actually say that? We've got Zaid Ahmad said tactical empathy. I love that. Really well oh. put. Um, Gareb, Seth, Donich, Calderon, Samson. Wow, a lot of people. Eric Wagner, Ben Brook. Yeah. There's literally hundreds. Yeah, so uh, this, less this, salesy. I like it. Yeah, you're exactly right, Scott. When you actually use words that your customers use, when you, as famous copywriter Robert Collier said, you're joining the conversation in their mind, they're more open and because it's more relatable. When you use words like this, streamlined, 360 view, optimized, increase sales, decrease costs, those are jargon words because people have heard them for so much, they're, they're desensitized. So this is real language, a very, very great um, observation out there in the crowd. So I've seen this happen again and again, and this SDR that I was just talking to told me this story, and this has worked really masterfully when timing is off. Hey, Josh, what happens if I'm having to diffuse objections over email? Well, let's not be theoretical. Let me actually show you a real email chain. <laughs> And I've tried to redact as much information as possible, but as Scott knows, I'm really bad with attention to detail. So some things may have slipped through, but it's for my business. So hopefully I'm not uh, gonna, gonna mess this up. We can fix it in post, right, Scott? Hopefully, or is this going live? Of course, know. of not. course. If, any, if anyone wants uh, a quick way to get Josh's attention, cold email, right. just call it as typos in this. And you know, that's, right. that's a, a need, let's Here go. Here we go. So um, this is a client that wanted to move forward with something. And they were not able to get on the phone because the time they were like in another country. She wanted a proposal. If you are sending proposals when people ask for them, you're doing it wrong. Question you should ask when someone's sending a proposal is, if I send you a proposal for the right amount of money and you like everything, what happens next? And then you'll hear the real objection. Well, I gotta talk about this with my boss, in which case a proposal is premature. So I never send proposals. Hey, assuming we're aligned on the proposal, is there budget based on the investment we discussed? Sounds good, but hey, we only have 8K. Could we shorten this a bit? Now, Scott, if you had to guess what I'm gonna say in email, based on some of this training that we've gone through, how do you think I'm going to respond? Or maybe we could pull the audience. What do you think let's, I'm going to uh, say? Let's give you an out. We'll, we'll pull the audience. All right, what am I going to say You're going to use a, a calibrated question um, around, you're going to try and get her to, to come up with it, to, to come up with a solution. I need, so you're to, gonna I need say, the actual thing I'm going to type. Does anyone have any idea? What am I going to type? We've got, we've got some good ones. All right, they're coming in so fast. Deep, I think Deepa, Deepa Kartha nailed it. Where, oh, where to go? How can I do 8K without reducing the number of participants? <laughs> so here I am. So first I'm gonna give a compliment. Thanks for your generous offer. I really wish I could do the project for 8K, I really do. But how would that work? I'm not sure how I could shorten the project without compromising your goals and then assertive tone. I just can't do that price. I completely understand. How about two proposals? <laughs> one short and one long. Would that work for you? How am I gonna respond now? Let's, let's hear it audience, give me, give me some help here. Another calibrated question I, I imagine you're gonna mirror, you're gonna label. I would say something around, you know, two proposals. Why, why, why two proposals kind of thing. All right, now we gotta be careful with the word why, yeah. because why can sound accusatory. And as Voss says, it kind of gets back to when we were little and we did something we weren't supposed to do and our parents said, why'd you do that? So why yeah. can feel very accusatory. We stay away from why and we use how and what. Thanks for getting creative. I'm always gonna start with a thank you, positive. I really wish I could do that. You're awesome to work with. 
Here's the calibrated. How can I create a short and long proposal without sacrificing your goals? What if I broke the payment up into installments? Would that help? Because so is it price or can you not all pay it at once? Okay, let me check and get back to you. Hey, I got 10 grand. Just like that. And I, they had a credit from a previous project. Okay. My guitar. There it is. It's a Stratocaster. I was getting rid of it because I was getting into acoustic. I put it on Craigslist for 500 bucks. Guy came over with his son, who was eight years old, and said, I want to get this for my son. He loves this guitar. And he took out $250 in front of his eight-year-old son and put it on the table and says, I'll give you $250. What do I say, Scott? $250? Your offer is very generous. I really wish I could do that. Assertive tone, but I simply can't let it go for that price. Okay, let's do 300. Scott, what do I say? You're gonna mirror him or, or label him? It, so, it sounds like you're gonna, or it feels like you're gonna have, feels like there's a certain price you want this guitar for. All right, now if I said that, well, does anyone else have any ideas in the audience? Uh, we've got Nick, I think Nick's got a good one. How am I supposed to do that? I'm gonna do a sort of again. Thanks, Bob, you've been very generous, but that is something I simply cannot do. Now, to Scott's point earlier, the tonality is key. That is something I simply cannot. This is a real thing that happened. Josh, would a label work in that environment too? Sure. Yeah. But at, so, at some point, at some point, you have to go assertive, which is essentially right. at this point, and it's such a simple negotiation. That there's a point at which I have to be assertive, meaning there's no budging. Right. So he came up again. 350, it's for my son. That's my limit. Now I'm going to ask the calibrated question. And here's what exactly what I said, which was not a lie, by the way. How can I reduce the price to 350 when I have three people coming to look at the guitar this afternoon? Now notice the beauty of this question. And I was able to think of it on the fly only because I went through Chris Voss's master class and he's got some unbelievable exercises in there that really bring this in. Who's solving the problem, me or the prospect? <laughs> prospect is solving the problem. I'm asking his for his help. Mm -hmm. Let me go to the ATM, I'll be right back. And he picked up the guitar for 500 bucks. I wanna go through some shameless plugs and then we're gonna take some questions. I got two plugs, two amazing offers. You cannot master this stuff without taking Chris Voss's master class. You cannot master it. You cannot get good at it. I think it's about 90 bucks. I don't exactly remember the price, but that's the URL. I highly recommend that you not only take the class, but you do what I did, which is to take notes. So many people go through these things and they just watch them passively. I took detailed notes on this. I watched that class. He's got some unbelievable practice exercises that you can use for your sales team and in your personal life. I practiced those with my wife. I practiced, practiced, practiced until I got my reps in and get better at it. I still practice. So take this class and don't just take it passively. Take it actively, take notes and get into the material deep. A lot of times people ask me what books I read. I'm like, just read one book, go deep into one thing rather than going in shallow into a lot of different things. And it's the doing that matters. So tinyurl.com slash boss masterclass. I've also taken a lot of these principles and scripted them out in my badass B2B growth guide. Um, so this is a guide of plays that will help you start more conversations with people you want to get in front of. It's a one-time fee and you get lifetime access to it. Um, I'm not going to sell it on this presentation. You can go to this website and you can see what changed for the better with other people that have bought it at tinyurl.com slash Josh Braun. 
What I'd like to do now, Scott, is open this up for questions. Let's do it. And I can't say enough good stuff about the B2B growth guide. I've heard it from 5 million people. We don't usually plug stuff, but it's so good that we can plug it. Um, and Josh, thank you for the presentation, man. Uh, I've actually done the masterclass and every time I talk to you, I'm like, damn it, I gotta go take it again. This time taking notes. Uh, it is one of those things. You can't just, you, you constantly have to be tweaking this stuff and you have to use it daily for an extended period of time or it feels very, very unnatural. Uh, which leads us to our, our first question. Uh, Wes has this question. I struggle to know what to say when I'm trying a label. Uh, it just feels awkward and not calibrated. How can I get better at nailing a label? Great question. So as Scott mentioned, this is a skill like getting good at anything. Your gut is gonna have something to say when you hear someone talk. You're just gonna feel something. And with time, you're gonna be able to start a sentence with it sounds like, it looks like, it feels like. And you're gonna be able to put words to it just based on what you're feeling. And then you're gonna pause. And the other person is either gonna say, well, not exactly, it's like this. Or you know what, yeah, and then they're gonna talk more. It comes from practice. Knowing isn't the same as doing. And when I say practice, I don't mean just in sales. It's amazing to me that we practice on our prospects. Like if we wanna get good at anything, running, biking, swimming, whatever, we practice off the court. So practice in your personal life with your significant other or your friends. When someone says something, start. It sounds like, feels like, looks like. And with practice, it will get more comfortable. You've gotta get your reps in. Without your reps and you're just doing it once in a while, it's like going to the gym, watching someone work out and then never really trying to lift the weights or maybe you do like one rep. It's really repetition. Mm -hmm. I was terrible at this at the beginning. I'm still not mm -hmm. proficient at it. Chris Voss is a master at it. He's been doing it for 25 years. You maybe have just heard about this maybe a year ago. Maybe you've heard of it and you've not even practiced it. So give yourself a break and practice it with people in your personal life. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I will say it, it, it's almost supposed to feel unnatural at the beginning. It should. It means you're not a, a sociopath or like there will be this tension. Uh, I know when I took the master class, I used it uh, to get a discount on my Airbnb. And it was the perfect non-threatening environment to use it on um, and kind of practice. I remember Josh, you said, you know, you use it to get like late checkouts and things. So those little environments where the stakes aren't high, that's where you use this stuff. You know, next time when you're choosing a restaurant to go with your significant other, try this stuff to, you know, see if you can uh, diffuse the, the objection of, of going somewhere you don't want to go. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I was, I was staring at an Airbnb too, and the air conditioning was really loud. We couldn't, we really couldn't stay in there. And we had signed a 30 day non-refundable monthly fear thing here in Boulder. And I said to the, uh, the prospect says that you can't cancel. It's too short notice. And I said, sounds like there's not enough time to get someone new into the apartment. And you'll lose out on a lot of money. And she said, that's right. And we had another conversation. I said, how's it gonna work if we can't sleep here because the air conditioning won't cool the apartment. And PS to make a long story short, and I have this on my LinkedIn feed, I didn't get the full 3,000 back. I got 2750 back on a non-refundable Airbnb by using these techniques. And to Scott's point, you're practicing it. It becomes second nature, but it's not in the beginning. Your beginning is to fight with the Airbnb person and tell her why she sucks. And I'm gonna leave you a bad review. Mm -hmm. I ended up saying, would it be a terrible idea if you only refunded me a partial amount so we can avoid a lengthy dispute process. Mm -hmm. And she said that, that I'd be open to that. And then we ended up settling on 2,700 bucks. But again, to your point, it's, it's practice. Yeah, totally. Here's another great question and something I personally struggle with as well. Uh, Angelo is asking, how do you know when to mirror, label, and ask the calibrated question? How do I know which one of my bag of tricks to use at any given point? 
So generally speaking, in the beginning of a conversation, the mirrors and the labels are really good. When you're first starting to have a conversation because you're trying to collect some information. So as a general rule, and there's no hard, fast rules, but as a general rule, label, mirror, label, mirror, label, mirror, calibrated question, perhaps something assertive, accusation audit. Usually you wouldn't go for the accusation audit at the beginning. Usually it's label mirror at the beginning. Again, making people feel heard first. Mm -hmm. I like it. Um, this is another good one. This is from Anonymous. They don't want to share their name. Um, but can mirror and labeling techniques also be adapted, uh, adapted sorry, to objections over email uh, to get prospects on the phone? Uh, specifically, I'm going to put my own kind of twist. Sorry to hijack the question. I personally feel weird mirroring over email. I don't feel like it comes across authentic. Do you mirror over email? Do you think you can, or is it more of a labeling kind no, of no, uh, Beck Holland. Is this Beck Holland asking this question? Yeah, so no <laughs> it problem. could be. That's why it's anonymous. No, this, this <laughs> definitely has to be synchronous communication, meaning yeah. you have to be talking to somebody. This does not work. Mirroring and labeling does not work over email. You'll notice my email negotiation, I wasn't labeling and mirroring. It was mostly calibrated questions and we were in the middle of a negotiation. It wasn't like cold email stuff going back and forth. This is not the right tool for that. Got it. Cool. Um, all right. We got another. A lot of people asking about the, the written stuff. Um, okay. So how do you deal with someone who says, I don't have budget now. We are on a complete spending freeze now due to the current COVID situation. Yes, Very so common. Yeah, so we covered this a little bit earlier in the webinar. We'll just role play it. So Scott's gonna be the prospect and I'm gonna be the salesperson. And Scott's gonna say, hey, this sounds interesting, but. Mm -hmm. Hey Josh, so this sounds interesting. You know, I, I, I like the service you provide. Unfortunately, you know, due to what's going on in the world, uh, our budgets are totally, totally frozen, unfortunately. Sounds like you don't really want to do anything until the ship show is over. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess you should, you could say that I do want to do stuff, but you know, my hands are kind of, kind of, kind of tied with with everything that's going on. Scott, you're you're probably going to think this is a really stupid idea, given what you just told me. But would you be opposed? to seeing if there are opportunities beyond what you have now to achieve X that might not be in your radar, not for now, but just so you can have them in your back pocket. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I, I couldn't do this now, but if we're thinking about doing something for the, for the future, I guess there's no harm in you know, checking it out. And that's the idea. And guys, remember this, this is again, gets back to the beginning. Scott could have said no again, that's okay. This is not magic stuff to overcome every time. It's to understand the basic truth behind every conversation, which is two things. Yes, the prospect is open to continuing the conversation or no, they're not at this time. These tools just give you the best mechanism to be able to get to more truth. So if your intent is I wanna use these things to get overcome, it's going to come through in how you say things. Mm -hmm. Your language, your tonality is going to sound all amped up. If you come at it with pure intent, which is non-assumptive, just getting to the truth, shining a light, seeing if they're open or not, and being okay either way. Mm -hmm. Totally. It's about getting to uncovering information. It's not, it's not voodoo magic. Um, holy, there's a lot of questions. Um, okay. So, Where's a good one? Um, ah, this is a good one. What about this situation? Very common situation uh, when you're, you're maybe cold calling someone and they say, you know, I just send me the stuff. And then uh, if I'm interested, we can arrange a meeting. Yeah, send me some information is a really, a really common one. So in that situation, this is what I would do. So let's, let's actually role play it, Scott. So I like to role play things because I like to role play things because I like to practice. Because guys, I, I, I do cold calls too. I do cold calls on my client's behalf with them. 
when I work with clients, I say, hey, guys, if I can't use this stuff to book meetings for your company, how can I expect you to do it? So this is good practice for me. So I'm just going to practice this live. So Scott's going to say, like, maybe I'm, a, hey, I'm selling my consulting services to Scott. And Scott's going to say, hey, Josh, sales DNA sounds awesome. Send me some information. Hey, Josh, you, you caught me out of the blue, jumping into a meeting. Uh, it sounds, sounds cool. Sell me what, send me whatever you got. I'll take a look. And if it sounds interesting, I'll get in touch. I've got your email. Scott, who could possibly be more important than I am? That's a, <laughs> that's a Josh Braun aside. Let's, let's not this trend. Let's take that. So, so some information, what information would be most helpful? Uh, you tell me, you know, that whatever is a good outline of, of what you do. Scott, hopefully this doesn't come across as too uncomfortable. But sometimes when people ask me to send them some information, it's just their nice way of saying that they're not interested right now, which is perfectly okay. You know what? I, I might fall in that bucket. I might fall in that bucket. Okay, so let's end role play. So wouldn't you rather know that than sending information that most of the time the prospect is not gonna read? And then I might say, you know, just so I don't do you a disservice and just so I don't flood your inbox with irrelevant information, would you be opposed to having a conversation so I can learn a little bit more about what you want and see if I could potentially help. Mm -hmm. Notice the tonality there and notice the language. I don't want you to do a service. Would you be opposed to? These are all different tools that I might pull out based on the scenario. And then that first one, when I said, who could be more important than me? That's my personality. That's a really key thing. If I can make someone feel something, like Scott laughed, and we didn't practice that. If I can make someone just a little bit smiley, it just, it's, it's, another great tool for diffusing. When we come across as too serious and we get that sales voice and we lose our personality, that's where we get into trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. Totally. Humor can be the, the secret weapon for sure. All so right. I, this was a great email that I saw uh, an SDR wrote uh, last week. Instead of saying, you know, fast, you know, 150% faster, he said something like, faster than an 80s hairband uses hairspray. Like <laughs> that is gonna make someone feel something. And when you make someone feel something with your email copy or your words or your tonality and you make them feel good, they're gonna want more of that drug. And that drug, that feel good drug is associated with you. It's actually oxytocin that's getting released into the bloodstream. So, so much of this also is, is your unique personality. A lot of you might be saying, oh my God, I would never say that. Not the words, the intent. However, your interpretation of that might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. Here's, I'm gonna sneak one more in. I know we got one more minute. Joe 12 says a fantastic question. Does it make sense to open a cold call with an accusation audit? Yeah, I've done this. And again, look, lots of ways to open up a cold call, but one of the ones I've done that I love is, um, here, Scott, pick up the phone. I, I, I'll, do a couple, I'll do a couple of my favorite ones. All right, so we'll do two of my favorites because people ask me this all the time. Josh, how do you open up a cold call? So here's number one, Scott, pick up the phone. Hello? Scott Barker, I think you got a problem. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's that? <laughs> all right, let me, let, me do, let me do my next one. I'll do three, I'll do three. Uh, second one, pick up. Hello? Scott Barker, do you like tickets? All right, tickets? Let me, let, me, let, me do, let me do my third one, accusation on it. Pick up the phone. Hello? Scott, this is a cold call, so you're probably gonna to wanna to hang up on me. And then be quiet, That's a good one. and then be quiet. Yeah. So that yes, the accusation audit is extremely powerful to start a cold call with. Mm -hmm. And again, it doesn't have to be those words, but this idea of labeling the negative emotion someone's thinking, which is, is this a cold call? So we're mm -hmm. just gonna call it out. Yeah. And then I automatically feel like you understand me because that's yeah. what I am thinking. So it's, right. it's perfect. Also, your tone there made me feel quite, quite comfortable. And the pause was, was part of the, the effect for sure. Yeah. All right, Josh, 
I always leave with a page full of notes and I always feel like I need to go do, do more homework and practice more. So that's a really good thing. Thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with the sales hacker community. Um, I think you might win for the most questions we've ever had. Um, so for all the questions we didn't get to, uh, please connect with Josh on LinkedIn if you haven't already. Um, and uh, he's actually really, really good at answering questions. I've seen him on the back of a bus uh, answering live questions. He usually will send you a little voice note. I thought it was really cool. Um, and please do check out uh, his B2B Badass Growth Guide. Uh, I've literally heard nothing but, but great things. And Josh, enjoy Boulder, man. Get some, get some laps in the bike. And uh, I, hope, I hope we can hang out very soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Scott, for the opportunity. Have a good one.